major keys. I have a very special guest today, Kendall Coyne Schofield. She is a five time world champion and Olympic gold medalist. She's a professional hockey player, and I'm so excited uh, to hear her perspective on how she found sport. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you so much for having me, Shatiana. I'm glad to be here and glad we could communicate in this way during these times. Yeah, we um, seem to uh, have a very similar passion for keeping young girls in sport. Um, and, and for you, it's developing those opportunities for young girls in sport. But before we get to that, I want to know, how did you find sports? Well, I started playing sports, all different sports, uh, because of my older brother, Kevin. He's three years older than me, and my parents put him in all different sports. Being the firstborn in our family, they just wanted to see what he loved the most, and whether it was wrestling, baseball, hockey, uh, taekwondo, he just he did everything. And as the younger sibling, I was brought to watch him play, and uh, when he went into the rink and he did hockey, I told my parents, well, I want to do what he does. I don't want to just sit here and watch him. I want to do that, too. And so this was, you know, well over uh, 25 years ago now, it, it, the girls that were in the rink were typically figure skating or they were watching their brothers like me. And so my parents said I could play, but they got me figure skates. Um, and then after a week of figure skates and after a week of realizing my skates are different than my brothers and I'm not on the same, you know, ice as him, I want to do what he does. And I absolutely love figure skating. It's one of my favorite winter Olympic sports to watch when I was at the Olympic games. Um, however, I just, I was different than what my brother was doing and I wanted to do what he did. And so after a week in figure skates, my parents got me hockey skates and that's how I was introduced to the sport. <laughs> yeah. And you were a multi-sport athlete. Was hockey your, your first sport or did and the others came along or uh, did, you, did you find another sport first? Yes. And for everyone listening, I think it's so important that, that kids play multiple sports. I was playing multiple sports until my junior year of high school, actually. And uh, that's when I stopped and I had that focus on hockey, but I was playing softball, baseball, track and field, basketball, and hockey. And so I was doing it all. And I'm very thankful that my parents, you know, were able to allow me to do all those opportunities. But usually it was my brother and I were a two for one deal and we were doing the same sports. So whatever he was doing, I was doing. And so uh, that, you know, that's where hockey came along. But uh, yeah, I, I loved hockey the most. I would say, you know, when I was doing other sports in the summer and hockey season ended, I, I definitely missed hockey more than I missed other sports when it wasn't, um, you know, hockey season. But at the same time, I was, I'm so thankful I had those different experiences because I feel like I would have been burnt out playing hockey if I was just focusing on hockey from the time I started skating when I was three till now. And you mentioned, you know, skating with your brother. Um, you played a lot with boys growing up. Um, whether that be because of opportunity. Um, I read that you, you went out for a travel team and you didn't make it one year and you came back the next year and made an older boys team. Mm -hmm. Was that kind of your Michael Jordan moment? Was that the, the, where everything got a turn for you? Oh, aren't we all enjoying the last dance? I must just say yes. Michael Jordan. It's been incredible. Uh, there's so many life lessons. There's just yeah. so much to learn from watching, um, you know, the greatest of all time, but uh, oh. you can call that my Michael Jordan moment. Uh, yeah. So growing up, I was playing boys hockey. I was typically the only girl in the rink. I was the only girl in school that played hockey and especially in the Chicagoland area where I grew up, the Chicago Blackhawks weren't as great of a team as we see today and the games weren't on television. So a lot of the kids I grew up with in school didn't even know about the sport, whether it was, they, they thought of it as, you know, a lesson in physical education class. Oh, it's, it's, you know, street hockey. That's, that's all they know. And then, and then I told them I played it and they're like, wait, I thought that was a sport for boys, you know? So it was a really tough time in school to, to fit in because no one was playing it. Definitely weren't people that were playing it weren't girls. So then when I would go to the rink, I still didn't fit in, in a place where I'm supposed to fit in, in my sport. And so, um, but at the same time I realized, well, you know, as much as these other parents want to tell my parents that I'm different and that I should go play sports that normal girls play, I knew my love and my passion for the game was deeper than anybody's negativity. And they couldn't, they couldn't pull that out of me and they couldn't define that for me. I defined it for myself through my love and my passion every single time I laced up my skates. Uh, so yeah, when I, my brother made the jump to travel hockey and of course me being the annoying little sister, I'm like, well, I want to do that too. <laughs> um, and so my parents said, okay, we'll, we'll allow you to try out if you, if you want, you know, to make that jump of that commitment to travel hockey. And so I tried out, and I ended up getting cut and I didn't know it at the time, but my parents told me years later that I got cut because I was a girl and the coach thought I would cause problems in the locker room and he didn't want a girl on his team. 
And so my mindset back then was like, well, I need to work harder. I need to get better. It, and, you know, it is what it is. And I still love this game. I'm still going to put everything I, I can into it and enjoy this hockey season. And I did that. And a year later, my parents said, well, okay, she keeps getting cut from this organization. Let's go, let's go somewhere else. And so I tried out for a level up, which is called AAA hockey. And so I got cut from the AA team. So I tried out for this AAA team. And I was a year younger than all of the boys. And I ended up making the team. And I remember thinking, okay, I know this is a pretty big step and I do fit in here. So, you know, no one ever said anything. So I realized the higher and higher that I got up in the game, the less, you know, critics and the less negativity. And it was, you know, game recognizes game. And these people didn't look at me as someone that was different. They looked at me as a hockey player. And that's for us in, in women's hockey, that's all we, we've asked. That's all we want. Just view me as a hockey player. Don't meet, view me any differently than, than you do, you know, the boy or the, the man sitting aside me. Kendall, I will tell you, I have, my next question for you was, how were you treated by the boys on your teams? And then I wrote in the notes, game recognized game. So you get it. That's the truth. You've been through it. Yeah. You know, that's the truth. Men who have gone through the same thing and worked their way up the same way we have building up our skill and our strength and all those different things, they recognize that it's an even playing field. We're not less than, we're just as good. So I, I love that. And it, clearly we were, we were on the same page with that. Mm -hmm. uh, what impact does sports have on you at a young age? You talk about, you know, coming back even stronger and, you know, persevering through the critics. What else did hockey in particular teach you? Uh, I mean, sports has been such a big part of my, my life. I don't want to say it is my life because I like, you know, I think I'm much greater than, you know, just a sport, but without sport, I, you know, there's, there's many things that I would not have ever accomplished or encounter without my love and, you know, my passion for sports. And, and one of those is being able to travel the world with team USA and, and meet my best friends. And I have to say my best friends have definitely come through sport because those are the people that, that I relate to that get, understand what the daily grind is like when you're, you know, in high school, when you're not going to prom and you're not going to the, you know, to the social events and, and it's Friday night and you're resting because you have a game Saturday night and they don't understand that, you know, your teammates get that and they don't find that odd. They don't find that, you know, oh, selfish or whatever it might be. They, they're just as committed to you are. So my, my greatest friends have definitely come through sport and, you know, I'll cherish those relationships forever. And then the other thing too, is being able to get a, a college education and play the sport I love. And, and hockey was such a uh, financially demanding sport on my parents and they sacrificed so much for me to play the sport. So to be able to get a college scholarship and, and hopefully pay them back in some small way, it, you know, was so important to me. And, you know, when I started playing when I was three years old, I never imagined that I would, you know, go to the Olympics and go to college and, and do all of these things. It was, it was a little girl who loved the sport more than anything. And that's what got me to where I am today. So yeah, it's been, it's been an incredible journey. And I think that's what I love so much about sports. It's, it's the journey. It's the little um, stories in between those championship moments that everybody sees. It, it's the moments that no one sees and that you remember forever. And, um, you know, it, the, you know, everyone talks about like, whether it's the locker room, the bus rides, you know, the team songs. I, I, I know, I'm sure you have this, you know, you have like a win song and you hear that song and you just instantly get a smile and think about your teammates and the moments that led up to that song. And it, you can't put it into words, words or describe it to, to somebody else, but it's just, it's just so powerful. And I, you know, I would encourage everybody to, to get involved in sports in whatever capacity that might be. That doesn't need to, that doesn't mean you need to be a player to, to be involved in sport. There's so many ways to be involved, but it's, it's just such a, a an amazing camaraderie of, of people that come together and it's really a microcosm of society. I think that that is one of the things that is overlooked often when we talk about keeping young girls in sport is that the building of friendships and lifelong friendships that you have in, you know, having a common language and more than just pushing through obstacles and things like that, like having teammates is one of the, the greatest parts of sport. Uh, you talk about the journey. Um, who were some of your role models during this journey when you were, you know, growing up aspiring to be an Olympian? Yeah. So right away, like I said before, that I didn't really see any other girls that were playing hockey and I didn't see women's hockey on TV. And unfortunately, here we are 25 years later and you barely still see it on TV. And it's something that needs to change. And I think it needs to change for a lot of sports. But growing up, I loved Chris Chelios. I was number seven uh, for a lot of my career for him. Uh, and then I met Cami Granado. And 
I don't know if you want to call it another Michael Jordan moment. I didn't get cut or anything, but it was, I finally saw someone that looked like me that did what I did. And then my dreams and my goals changed. And I wanted to aspire to be her. And I wanted to aspire to go to the Olympic games and win a gold medal. When before I was like, Oh, I want to be like my brother. He wants to go to the NHL, win the Stanley cup. Yeah. I want to raise that cup over my head too. That's the pinnacle of our sport. And then it, you know, becomes a reality. Well, that's not for you. That's for him. And I was like, well, what is it for me? And and then you, you realize, okay, so the pinnacle is the Olympic games and meeting Cami Granato was just was such a moment that changed my life forever. And it's something that like the feeling of empowerment she gave me is something that sticks with me to this day, because, you know, as soon as I graduated college and I was able to host my own hockey camp, I was like, I'm, I'm doing this because that's what Cami did. And Cami changed my life. And she changed so many lives of players who won a gold medal two years ago at the Olympic games, because they saw her and they saw her teammates and they saw women's Olympic hockey on TV for the first time in 98. And they were like, Oh, so this is where I'm supposed to be. This is where I belong. How do I get there? Visibility and representation on TV, like you mentioned, is so important. And in 2019, you participated in the All-Star NHL uh, Skills Challenge. How important is that for a young uh, hockey player? It's so important. And I think when, when I think back to that moment, it, that moment wasn't about who skated it it was the platform that it was skated on. And that platform was alongside the greatest players in the National Hockey League in the the year of 2019. And there's so many people that tune into that event year by year. They see those players on a regular basis, but there definitely was one player out there that they don't see on a regular basis, which I wish they did. And that was me. And I was doing something that I've been doing since I was three years old. I've been skating like that, you know, since I, I started skating, skating's always been my strength. And so I knew that I had the opportunity to really showcase the women's game and to showcase that girls do belong in this sport from the time that they're, however old they start, you're never too old or you're never too young to start the game. But that was an opportunity to show like, look, we belong in this sport too. And you know, credit is due to the National Hockey League for providing that platform. And I, I do think we earned that platform because if they didn't think that we could seize that moment, and I mean we because there were a lot of players who came before me and a lot of players who skate along, alongside me on a regular basis that earned that moment because of the product that we've put on the ice day by day to prove that women's hockey has grown substantially in the last 20 years. And we deserve a platform like that one on a regular basis to showcase our game because everyone thinks women's hockey is only relevant every four years when they see it at the Olympic games, but we're working every day. It's not every four years. So where and how can we build a platform together that showcases our game, you know, collectively and routinely. And you and your teammates, have done a great job in, in pushing that, pushing that forward and, and wanting to make headway for young girls in that space. And in 2017, your team decided together that it would be important to, you know, possibly go on strike ahead of the world championships. And one of those things that you all were pushing for was that there would be more opportunities for young girls in hockey. And this is different from things like, you know, um, the WNBA, they just passed a new CBA. Um, Obviously, uh, the women's national team for soccer similarly have been pushing against their national governing body. Mm -hmm. I think what's different, though, is that the pay difference in in these areas, right? So you all had a lot on the line not participating. Things like if you're a full-time hockey player, you may not be able to make ends meet in a certain way without having a second job. And I think some of those other leagues may not be in that same circumstance. So I think you all had a lot more to lose. Why was it so important? And how did you and your teammates come together and say, well, you know, we want to create these opportunities and we want to improve the game so much so that we are willing to risk so much. Yeah. So it was, I think in order to be successful in anything, you have to have one collective voice and dating back to 2016, 2017 season, we had the right group of players, the group of players that were willing to put their foot down and say enough is enough. We're currently making $24,000 a year from the USOPC, which was the USOC at that time. And we were told to be an elite athlete and happy to represent our country, that they don't make us represent our country. They don't make us train and eat and, and sleep and, and put in the you know resources that it takes to be elite and win a gold medal. You know, we're, we're not telling you to do all those things. You're, that's, a, that's your choice. And so with the $24,000 we were getting, I mean, you can't live on that, let alone be professional or elite in a sport, you know, in any capacity. 
And so we had the right group and the negotiations were, were more than those two weeks in which we went public and we said we were going to boycott the world championships. But we knew as a group, we didn't have much leverage because we never really had much before. And our only leverage was to boycott the world championships that were on home soil for the first time since 2012. And so we said, you know what? We have to be willing to commit as a group. If, if we don't come to a significant, if we don't come to an agreement and significant progress is not made, we have to be comfortable not playing. And it's, and it's really tough. And I've even thought about it a lot during this time because, uh, we didn't play the world championships this past April because of the coronavirus. So even missing these worlds, it it eats you away a little bit thinking, Oh, I, you know, my clock is ticking. I don't know if I'll get another opportunity. We had five rookies that were going to make our national team debut and you, you're, you know, your heart hurts for them as well. And so thinking like, wow, this could have been the reality of 2017 if significant progress wasn't made, but significant progress was made. And and even more so we, we won the tournament and they always say, put your money where your mouth is, but we, we definitely did. And and we won and it was a sold out building and it, it was just, it was incredible. But three of the main buckets that we were, we were fighting for was one was compensation. One was marketing and one was more programming. And I know it's different than, you know, the WNBA and what the women's soccer team has fought for, but we've looked to them. We've called them, we've relied on them and they have forged a path for a sport like us. Who's a little bit behind basketball and a little bit behind soccer. And we've looked to them and, okay, how did you do it? What do you, you know, our lawyers are the same lawyers at Ballard and Spar who represent the 99 soccer team. And so finally, you know, we, we, the, everyone is, you know, helping each other and we've looked to those, you know, to those women for, for leadership and guidance. And, and we were able to be successful. And I think too, when, when we were successful, we've seen this sport grow so much greater than just those players on that team. And that, that's what this fight was for. And you even look at the national hockey league right now. And a year ago, there were seven organizations that had all girls programming. Now there's 24. And to see that jump in just one year, and I've seen it firsthand by the work that I do with, you know, kids in the community, that there's so many parents that are willing to sign their young girl up for sport because it's for all girls, you know, and my parents didn't think anything of it. And my parents took some heat for it being like, why are you doing to the, why are you, why are you putting your little girl in a sport that's for boys? Like, do you realize she's different? Do you realize she doesn't fit in? My parents were like, you go tell her that she She's dragging us out of bed every morning. She's making us take her. You know, we're, we're doing, you know, she loves this. Like, no, she doesn't fe- fe- view that. But now, you know, parents don't have to overcome that hurdle for young, for their young girl. There's families now where their firstborn is a girl and she says, I want to play hockey. She doesn't have an older brother and she's not looking to her older brother to say, I want to do what he does. She's saying, I want to play hockey. And her younger brother saying, I want to do what she does. And to see that transition has been because of the implementation of all girls programming around the United States and, and the growth of the game. And, and so it, it's been exciting to see. And I, and I, I really do think we're, we're heading in the right direction in terms of, of girls and women's hockey in the United States. I watched a panel you are a part of for the women's sports foundation and you said a young girl came up to you and said, I want to be just like you. Um, your response to her was that, no, I want you to be better than me. And I want uh, the game to be better for you when you get to it. What things do you want to make better for her? So when, when my brother and I were growing up alongside each other, playing the same sport we loved, he knew he could always make a living playing this game if he was good enough to do so. I can't. And that's still the reality to this day. And so I want a young girl to grow up and be able to play the sport she loves and know she can make a living doing it. And if that's sports hockey, I am working every single day along with a lot of my teammates to fight so that opportunity is available for that young girl to grow up and, and be a professional hockey player and make a living doing it because they can't right now. And, and it doesn't really hit you until you're going through the college recruiting process. And that's when it really hit home for me that, okay, I need to pick a school that's going to set me up for a job after, after college. And I know that job's not hockey. So, you know, I need to figure that out where I know my husband, you know, he plays professional football and he picked a school that was going to help him get an education, but then also help him pursue his career to be a professional football player. And so when does that landscape change? When does a woman who played hockey in college graduate, get drafted to a team and pack her life up and go to a city to win a championship? We all just saw that happen to Sabrina Unescu, you know, a couple of weeks ago with the WNBA. She's packing her life up, going across the country from California to New York or Oregon to New York. And, and you know, she's trying to win a championship for that city. And that city picked her because of her merit, not because of convenience. And right now, in order for a woman to continue to play hockey 
after college, you have to get a job that, that helps you live a sustainable life. And then also allows you to maybe miss a, miss a day of work here and there. So you can continue to play hockey. If you don't have that full-time job that anchors your life, you can't play hockey. And so when do those, when does that change? When do those tides turn where you're graduating and you're looking for the best training opportunity, the best team, you know, who wants to pick you up and, and win a championship for that city. And, and then you do something on the side if, if you are able to, but right now it, we, we can't, we, you immediately look for that job and, and you continue to play hockey on the side. Well, Kendall, with your uh, passion, it is evident that, that someday for that young girl, that, that will actually happen because of the work that you're doing. Um, what is your favorite female sports moment as we start to wrap up? My favorite female sports moment, did you say? Of all time. Yep. Female sports moment. Oh, of all time. Yes. I, there's a lot. I have so many. Okay. Well, give, give me maybe two or three. Your okay. top two or three. I, I love, I was young, but I love when Brandy Chastain ripped off her shirt and, and it just was such a powerful and iconic moment that I, we were able to meet Brandy, uh, when we played a game in San Jose and just to see her, I was like, can you rip your shirt off again? Like, <laughs> this is amazing. And like, just to see her and just the power of that moment, because you know what, that, that was an athlete that celebrated that so authentically. It didn't matter what was underneath that shirt. It was a champion. It was nothing else but a champion. And I, I think that was an incredible moment. Um, have, mental, you um the replays? What? have you seen the replays of the 99 game? Oh yeah, of course. Okay. okay. They've been playing oh. a lot lately. So I just, been yes. much, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Julie Foudy has been an incredible ambassador for, for all women in sport, but especially for us in hockey, she's been, so helpful to us and you know when you get to know them as as people you understand you know just the fight that they went through and and we've learned so much from them and we're very I'm just so thankful for their leadership and guidance and friendship um I, I wish I was a little bit older in 99 yeah. <laughs> but at the same time I've watched it you know hundreds of times since yeah. um another another pretty iconic moment for women in sport uh, was when Manol Riam played in 92 in an exhibition game with the Tampa Bay Lightning. She was a goaltender. She was my hockey coach, actually, as well. So that was pretty cool to um, be able to work side by side with her. Um, oh, I mean, anytime you get to see Serena play tennis, I think is iconic. <laughs> I can keep going. And, I know, no, I agree. And then I would say, too, I, I think what I was, I'm so bummed about, and I think, we, you know, we're all impacted in some way, but I was really looking forward to watching. Simone Biles make history this summer. And, um, you know, that's another one. She's another athlete I look at and I'm just, I just draw so much inspiration from and every, uh, just, she's just so dominant. I mean, we, we're watching the last dance and I think we see someone who's equally dominant in their sport. You know, like we see Michael Jordan. I mean, Simone Biles has, has done that, you know, her whole career. So, uh, those are, I'm trying to think if there was, I, gosh, this is a hard question for a sports junkie. I mean, there's so many. <laughs> no, I think that those are, those are fantastic. I'm hoping that we get to see Simone Biles, you know, continue to uh, make history because obviously gymnastics is a little time sensitive, but I mean, she's shown that she has no limit so far. So I have no doubt that she'll. How about Katie Ledecky? Oh, I can't. Yeah. All these are just incredible, incredible athletes. You know, it, they've, they've pushed the boundaries. I think they've opened the eyes of people who didn't think women could accomplish what they accomplish. And they've, they've exceeded the, even those expectations. And I think when they, when they succeed in the way that they do, people don't see them as, as a gender, they see them as an athlete. Right. And they, they, they're just such iconic women because they're just so amazing at what they do that they, they smash all stereotypes, all perceptions. They just are game and talent. What are your top sports moments? I know. I felt like you, I felt like you were going to turn that on me. Okay. So, oh, I guess I've never thought about this. For women's basketball, because that's what I grew up playing. For me, it was, I guess, watching Tennessee during that, like, 2008 era. I talked about this on a few of my other episodes. It's that, like, golden era. There's, like, Candace Parker, Maya Moore, you know, that, that group of people. So that... Um, oh my goodness, Kendall, you're putting me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think what Olympic moments I've watched recently. I, 
Serena's what, like my yeah. all time, all time favorite, I think. And I'm not really into tennis, to be honest with you, but you know, she's just one of those people, like you said, they transit, what am I trying to say? Transcend sport. Yeah. And um, they become bigger than b- bigger than their sport. So I didn't grow up watching tennis, but pretty much anytime Serena's on the television, I'm going to be there. Yep. Um, surprisingly, the U.S. women's soccer team, I've been a junkie since about 2011 with Amy Wambach. So I guess her, her goal against Brazil, that will be the one oh. for me to get them uh, out of the semifinals. Good so one. That one's huge. Yes. Um, yeah, that, those are what come to mind right now. Oh, but I feel like, I feel like I have a lot more, but I feel like the Brandy Chastain one, that one's amazing. I mean, I was rewatching the, uh, the rerun the other day and just like chills everywhere. Just the thought that, you know, they knew going into that game, how big the game was and how big it was going to be for young girls. Uh, to me, you know, I-, I live for that sort of thing. Yeah, well, and that's a good point you brought up with how big the 99 moment was for young girls and how it inspired a whole generation. I think, you know, I, I didn't even mention the one in my own sport, but Again, I was fairly young, but it was a 98 women's hockey team. You know, that was the inauguration of women's hockey at the Olympic Games. And that was, you know, such a big moment for our sport and for a lot of people to realize, oh, girls and women do play hockey. You know, that was another one that it's just crazy how they were back to back years with hockey and soccer. And here we are, you know, 20 years later and, you know, we're looking to soccer for advice and, and we're, you know, we we're still in this, you know, fight together, which is, it's been cool to see. And it's been awesome to develop relationships with, you know, so many of the soccer players and, you know, we're all in it together. (laughs) Which I'm glad to hear that that's how this has been working for your team. Cause uh, you know, you mentioned we might be, a few years behind, or I think you said 20 other sports, but I'm glad to know that each team or each program is kind of pulling the other along and, and, you know, giving advice in that way, because I mean, that, that's the only way we're going to get it done. And setting the standard, right? Like I I remember, I think I shed a tear when NECA was on good morning America and they announced this, the eight year CBA agreement. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And then she mentioned, she goes, we know we have women's hockey looking up to us. And I was like, you know, and, and I was like, wow, like, you know, your dreams aren't too big. Like, look at what they just accomplished. We, we, we haven't even dug the dirt of our foundation for women's professional hockey yet. And, you know, I think women's basketball has, is obviously built a foundation. So we have a long way to go, but just, you know, hearing and seeing the fight that they've been successful in and continue to be successful in only provides optimism through like our long days and our hard fights. And, and we look to them for so much support and guidance because they show it can be done. Yeah. And I think marketing, 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 so important. I'm so glad that you mentioned that about, you know, what you all were fighting for back in 2017 WNBA, the same thing. It's, you know, it's so much about marketing and getting our stories out there because I just feel like when you know the players, it is so much easier to, to support. And again, that is why, you know, I, I do this project. But, you know, I think for us in women's sports, we, it, it just gets old when people say, oh, well, you can't fill the building. We lose money and, and it, it, it's not enjoyable to watch. And, you know, I, I challenge people to say, well, have you ever been to a women's sporting event? And likely, you know, the answer is no. And then the other thing too is, you know, how much has, you know, the organize, organizing body invested into that program, you know, because you're as good as your investment. So if you're not investing with the same resources and the same marketing, well, there's a reason that the building's empty. No one knows that they're playing. So you have to, you have to put in something in order to get a return on your investment. And, th- and that goes for the players resources and the marketing of that team or those players, just like you said, like telling their stories, you know, banners, flyers, TV ads, you know, making sure the games are on TV with a media deal. And it just really seems that the, the WNBA has, has really transcended into that uh, path of, of, you know, we're, we're going to put ourselves in the best position to succeed and fill buildings and, you know, do as much as we can, but then also put some ownership on other people and be like, look, we can't do it all as players. My last question to you um, is, so I call the show major keys and I ask my guests at the end of every uh, episode, what is one major key that you would give to young girls or women out there that are trying to achieve it and break barriers? A major key that I would give to uh, young athletes anywhere is to always follow your dreams, always believe in yourself and be willing to put the work in, in order to accomplish those dreams. And it's not, it's not always easy. There's going to be bumps along the way, but um, you know, stay true to, to your dreams, to who you are and you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. Keys, keys, keys. I got the keys, keys.